One of my favorite additions to Houdini 18 are all the improvements that have been made for the lighting workflow. For instance, if we make a light mixer, this will give us a great way of balancing all the various exposures for the lights in our scene. So all you do is you drag over the light to this section, and now we have this little mixer that shows up. On the right hand side, we have the exposure and stops, and then on the left, we have intensity. So we have that, we can change the color right here. So if we want to add a little bit of temperature to our HDR, let's say we want to warm it up a little bit, we can do something like this. So that's kind of cool. We can also mute the lights by hitting this icon. So now we're just seeing the key light right there. And it's really just a very convenient way of dialing in your settings and, and working with these lights. Before it took a long time to get all this. And uh, yeah, again, Probably one of my favorite things about Houdini 18 so far. Okay, so uh, let's just dial this in. Let's uh, turn up the dome light. Also, let's start Karma so that we can see what's going on. I'm going to solo this key light by hitting a star. And then let's bring the exposure up so that we have something a bit more like that. There we go. And I want this key light to be probably the most intense thing in the scene. So we'll, we'll do something like that. And then I'll just use this dome light as a way of filling in all the remaining lights. So I'll probably go down on this just a tad bit. I can solo this by hitting the star. And now, again, I just want a very, you know, kind of dark, subtle fill from this dome light. And so that's very easy to see and achieve with this light mixer. You'll also be really happy to know that now we have a much better way for light linking. So check this out. Let's create a light linker. Plug that in, and it's very similar. All you do is you drag over whatever it is that you're trying to work with. So in this case, let's say that I don't want the key light to affect the backdrop. So I can do it two ways. I could say, all right, key light, you are not allowed to affect backdrop. And see this little X icon over the sun? That means you should not light this. It's pretty, I love how intuitive that is. It's totally great. And as you can see, it works. Another way to do that is the other way around. We could say, all right, well, backdrop. You are not allowed to have key light. And you just drag it over like that. And that will achieve the same exact thing. Now, another thing to know as well is if you have multiple rules going on, so let's say that we have a dome light over here, and let's say for the dome lights, Alfred is not allowed to be affected by the dome light. Okay? I think by default, this filter based on selection is checked, and so you'll notice that this middle section changes based on whatever we select here, which can be a really good thing if you have a big scene. But in this case, if we uncheck that, this gives us a view of all the various rules that have been made. And for a small scene like this, that seems to make the most sense. I think by now, Alfred's just about ready for his big blockbuster debut. And so that means we need to render. But we're a little bit noisy, as you can see. So let's talk about these karma settings and what's happening. It's actually a lot more straightforward on this note than it is on the mantra note, in my opinion. We start off with the frame range, the camera. This camera, again, is referring to the USD camera that's defined down here in the scene graph tree. So just keep that in mind. The resolution, and that's the main thing right there. We do have these other settings right here, but they're a little bit miscellaneous for the time being. Under the images, this is where we save out our image file. If we press this little down arrow, we have a few presets, which is nice. So let's say that we want a sequence of EXR files, which most of the time, that's what you want. You can specify the output picture. So let's just save this out to our render. I like saying $OS. That means take the node name, $OS, $F4.EXR, like so. And for now, I'm going to keep the EXR mode and the color limit as they are. We also have this Optex denoiser, so that's kind of cool. I found in practice that the denoiser is especially helpful whenever you're trying to light things. 
However, however, for a final render, I think that sometimes it can produce some unexpected artifacts that are difficult to remove. So it's a bit more of a conservative bet to leave that off in most situations. In my opinion. But I could be wrong. So feel free to prove me wrong if that's not the case. <laughs> but anyway, that is what that's all about. The next tab is rendering. This is our main render settings. Here we have the samples. So if we turn up our samples, we get a better result. Let's change this to... Let's change this to 256, like that. And the other main setting to this is this variance threshold, which, if you're familiar with the mantra node, is basically your noise level. So, in other words, we have these pixel samples. This is how many samples that we're allowed to use. And then this variance threshold is on the lookout for saying, okay, this spot is good. We don't need to go all the way up to 256 anymore. And it does this by looking at the contrast between neighboring pixels, and it figures out whether or not a pixel is clean enough so that we don't waste samples up here. So this is like a cap to the samples. The variance threshold, again, is all about preserving the number of rays so that we don't have to use the full 256 on every single pixel. It takes a little while for that to sink in, but that is essentially how I understand this. I'm going to change this to 0 .005, like that. And then also for the light sample quality, let's change this to 2, like so. And I think we're just about good with all this. The last thing that I will say is this. So, we have this all set up, we're good to go. Let's bring this back to Houdini GL for a second. And then, moment of truth, we say, save to disk. And what just happened? <laughs> Looks like nothing, right? But, check this out. Something did just happen. If you hold down Control shift escape on Windows, this will bring up the task manager. Look at that. I'm cranking away on all these threads right now. And... So it is rendering, right? If I go to the process, we have this little husk exe. I think that's what, uh, yeah, it looks like that's what's actually rendering. So it's rendering. How can we check the progress of this? Well, we can go to render and we can say scheduler. And there it is. Now we're looking at that job. We can kill the job. We can pause the job if we want. This is where we see what's happening. So I'm going to pause this video, and let's see what our final result looks like. Now I'd like to forewarn you about something, because it just got done rendering for about 12 minutes, but if I go to the render folder, uh-oh, there's nothing in there. So right now, and I imagine this will be probably fixed in the future, but Karma is not creating intermediate directories, so what that means is that you have to create the folder yourself. You can't rely on just the name right here to make a folder for you. So let's call this our Alfred render, like that. And then I'm just going to specify exactly where I want this. So let's go like that, and then let's call this our Alfred render.exr. And let's try that one more time. And alas, we have Alfred the Rhino. Now there's all sorts of other things to be said about Lops and Karma, but by now I hope that you have a general overview of how the whole system works. In my future courses, I'll be getting into more detailed approaches and workflows that work with Karma and work with Lops and everything we just talked about. So stay tuned for that. Until then, Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great day.